Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Thursday nights in the Word. Um, we just appreciate you uh, tuning in with us and, and being a part of what we're doing here and taking some time to look into God's Word. You know, the Bible says that God's Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And we want to we want to know the Word. The Word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Um, it is the cleansing agent that transforms us. And so um, we know that we're washed by the water of the word. And we want to make sure that our minds and our hearts are being transformed into the likeness of Christ. And how is that going to happen? It's going to happen through our devouring the word of God. And so we've been talking a little bit about Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, that talks about um, leaving the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, uh, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. These six doctrines that we're talking about are the very foundations that a Christian needs in their life to make sure that they're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, that they're established and understand, have an understanding of repentance from dead works. What does that mean? Faith toward God. What does that mean? Doctrine of baptisms, being able to understand them, the, the significance and importance of laying on of hands, uh, the resurrection of the dead, um, which we are going to see and experience one of these days. And then also, what does it mean when it comes to the judgment? And so we want to help to establish Christians so that they have a good foundation because I believe one of the problems that we have today in Christianity is people are unstable. Um, it, the scripture teaches us a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. The scripture tells us um, that um, we have to have our focus on um, the kingdom of God and God's righteousness and God's word and God's plan, that God is expecting us to follow after him. And he, and he also tells us in his word that we err, we fall short, we make these errors and mistakes, because we do not know the scriptures. And so we do not want to be the body of Christ that's ignorant. We want to be the body of Christ that's equipped. Scripture teaches us that um, Jesus gave, Ephesians 4.11 says, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. For how long? till we all come to the unity of the faith, unto the fullness of the stature of Christ, a mature um, believer, that we would not be tossed to and fro, uh, that we would not wander in the wilderness, that we would be steadfast, unmovable in the faith. That's what God's after, and that's what we're after here at Bethesda. And we just appreciate you being with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for those that have joined with us. We ask that you would bless this time together, Lord, and uh, let us re receive something from it that we can take into the rest of our week and have a clear understanding of what um, thus saith the word of the Lord. We've been talking about the doctrine of baptisms and we've covered um, the doctrine of baptism in water. Um, we, we talked about how um, the Greek word for baptism is baptizo, which means to cause to be immersed or dipped into something. And we, we discussed that and how important it is that following repentance, a person needs to be baptized because that is a part of our salvation. That, that salvation that we're talking about, that the saving of our soul that was destitute, totally away from God, not seeking after God, not desiring God. We were fallen man. But once we have been regenerated, awakened by the Holy Spirit, made new, made alive by the Holy Spirit, 
and we receive the gift of faith and we receive the gift of repentance and we do that and we believe in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us, the scripture teaches us that we are to be baptized. And so we've discussed that, the importance, the significance, who is supposed to be baptized, when should you be baptized, who should do the baptizing, which is any of us who have been baptized ourselves, um, that we need to make sure that we are a part of the priesthood of believers doing the work that Jesus has sent us to do. And now we want to start talking about probably one of the most controversial subjects in church today. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And um, we're studying um, and have studied baptism in water. Now we're going to focus on um, this controversial subject of baptism in the Holy Spirit. In our, in our studies to come on this subject, we're going to um, talk about Holy Spirit baptism and um, look at what the scripture teaches, not what man teaches, not what our own ideas are, but what does the scripture say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Um, when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this baptism is an, an, an enabling and empowering baptism so that the believer can walk worthy of his vocation and lay hold of the inheritance of the saints, which is reserved for us in spiritual realms. Holy Spirit baptism is to be distinguished from baptism into water. It's different than baptism in water. It's, and so Acts 1, 4, and 5 says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Also, Matthew 3.11, he says, I baptize, you, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So it's important that we understand that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is distinguished from our initial aspects of our giving our hearts to Jesus and water baptism. A lot of people teach today that that was all received at our new birth. Um, but yet the scripture has something different to say concerning that. And so we want to make sure that we do what the scripture says, not what man's opinion or ideas are. And so we want to take a look at, though, as we start into this um, and talk about Old Testament regeneration. As we begin this study in Holy Spirit baptism, we need to consider a theological doctrine which, if scripturally understood, would greatly enhance our understanding of the Holy Spirit baptism. The theological doctrine I referred to is that of spiritual regeneration of the Old Testament saints. Many don't believe that those Old Testament saints were born again, but were, they believe that they were saved under the law, whereas we are saved under grace. Uh, the teaching that, uh, from most people is that the Old Testament saints, they, they were saved, they were rescued um, because of the law. But when we look deeper into the scripture, we see that every person who is saved, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament, is saved by grace through faith. Nobody, nobody, Old Testament or New Testament, was saved outside of faith in the work of God. No one, not even Abraham, was justified by the deeds of the law. Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 19, it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. 
But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works. No, but by a law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Romans 4, 1 through 9. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. But not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted it was counted to him as righteousness now to the one who works his wages are not counted as a gift but as his due and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly his faith is counted for him to him for righteousness just as david also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom god counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. And so we know Abraham was righteous, not by the works of the law, but through faith in God and God's provision. So Abraham was saved through faith, not through works, not through works. And so when we, when we look at that, we have to know then that God saves us and our forefathers through faith and not works. Many scholars say that no one could be saved or born again until after Jesus went to the cross. But we must understand that we are not saved through the cross, but through faith. Now, the cross, it's not that the cross is not important. But the cross does not regenerate. Faith does. However, if it was not for the cross, our faith would be in vain. Without the cross and our appropriating um, the atoning work of Jesus in our behalf through faith would be worthless. So that Jesus' burial or death on the cross was um, vital for us in order that we might be able to operate in faith. But the Old Testament saints, they are not without that because the Old Testament saints were looking forward to the work of Christ. They were looking ahead at what was going to take place by faith, by faith to the cross. 
and the New Testament saints, we're looking back by faith at what Jesus did on the cross. Both through faith have partaken of the same spiritual provision. Can we say amen? We can. We believe. We thank God for it. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4 says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. Listen now. For what was it they drank? For they drank from the same spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So they were drinking from the same spiritual rock that you and I are drinking from. They were drinking looking forward to the work of God. We are drinking looking back at the work of God. But both of us, Old Testament, New Testament believers, were all looking at the same thing, and that was God's provision for our lives. And we know that provision was the rock Christ Jesus. And so that's who they drink from, and that's who we drink from. To say that the saints such as Abraham, Moses, and David were not reborn in heart would be to attribute their intimate relationship with God to be the result of works or deeds of the law. In Abraham's case, we see that he looked ahead by faith to a city and died not having received it. He said, I'm looking forward to a city whose builder and maker is God. Even though he did not receive it, Abraham by faith believed God that it was coming. Its fulfillment in another generation is what gave credibility to Abraham's faith. The difference between the covenants, when we talk about this, the difference between the covenants of the Old Testament and the New Testament is not about regeneration. It's not about how they receive salvation or how we receive salvation because both of them had to be the same because no one is saved by the works of the law. Everyone that is saved, Old Testament, New Testament alike, were saved by believing and having faith in the work of God. And so that's not the difference between Old Testament and New Testament believers, but yet we know there's a difference. But I want to say that the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament believers is where the Holy Spirit was going to dwell. John 14, 15 through 17 says this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, listen, he dwells with you and will be in you. Who is Jesus speaking to there? He's speaking to his disciples, and the disciples were already believers. We have Almost everyone would confess and believe the disciples' sins were forgiven them, and they were already believers. They started out um, belonging with Christ. They were going with him, and they felt they belonged in the mission and what he was doing. And as they went along, they started having a desire to become like Christ. Jesus, teach us to pray, they said at one point. Jesus sent them out to cast out devils and open blinded eyes at one point. They wanted to do the works of God, so they were becoming like him. But also the Bible teaches us that they believe, because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, Who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elias, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're, you're, you're uh, one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? Peter declares for all of them, thou art the Christ. In other words, you are the anointed one sent from God. You are God in the flesh. And Jesus says to him, Peter, flesh and blood could not have revealed that to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed that to you. 
Why? Because that understanding of who Jesus was, Peter believed. And so when Jesus is speaking to them, the Holy Spirit, you know him. The Holy Spirit, he dwells um, with you. But yet, look, wait a minute, it's not going to be just that he dwells with you like he has in the past. In the Old Testament, he was with them, on them, sometimes worked through them, but yet he was not resident in them. The Bible says Samson, after he gave away his secret to his strength, he rose up as he had often done, shook himself, and had not realized the Holy Spirit had lifted from him. And he was just as another man. Holy Spirit came upon him. Holy Spirit left him. But Jesus says things are about to be different. He's not only going to be with you, he's going to be in you. When we look at that translation of in, um, we, we see um, the Greek word there as it's translated uh, more often is translated as I-N, not E-N. And we would be better off if we would say that we have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we are baptized with the Holy Spirit and He is working in us. And so it's important that we understand that this Holy Spirit is going to have a different location than the Old Testament saints had. He was on them, with them, as I spoke before. Now he's going to be in us. In the Old Testament, the cloud or the Holy Spirit was with them. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit dwells within the believer who receives the Holy Spirit baptism. Christians who have not received the Holy Spirit baptism are regenerated even as the Old Testament saints were, but walk under the same inferior limitations of the Old Testament. The New Testament promise of a better covenant had to do with the promise of the Holy Spirit being put within the believer and that the law would be written no longer on external tables of stone, but on the hearts within us. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27 says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. He's talking about the new covenant, the new heart. I will put my spirit not on you, within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Hebrews 8, 10 through 13 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And, and what is becoming obsolete is growing old, is ready to vanish. So the old covenant was passing away and the new covenant was being established. And so God is now writing upon our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit, his laws. God is putting in us a provision for us to walk in victory and to walk in uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. God wants us to deal with and live through and walk in this that God has given us. Why would we want to walk in less than what we have the privilege of walking? I don't know about you, but I desire to receive all that God has for me. I don't want to leave not one thing out. I want every provision that God has promised to me so that I can live a victorious life on this earth. The Bible teaches us 
that the Holy Spirit was predicted and promised. Um, there's a lot of scripture. I just want to read a few. Um, let's look at Luke 24 and 49. It says this, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Acts 1, 4 and 5 says, And while staying with them, he ordered them to depart, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Acts chapter 2, 4 says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts 2, 17. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Acts 2, 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Peter preaching to those that had gathered that day of Pentecost. Acts 2, 38, 39. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So here he says the first order of business is to repent, cry out to God, change our minds and direction, go from following the flesh to looking to following God, looking to God, the answer to all of our situations. Repent, turn away from and turn toward God. That's what he said the first order of business is. And then Every one of you needs to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. What we've already talked about. These were the first things that were to take place. Not that they all took place together. Because before you can be baptized in water, you have to have gone through repentance. You, he says, repent first, be baptized in water. But look what he says. After this, and after that takes place, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not at the same time, not before, but after. Subsequent to us being saved and us being baptized in water, he wants us to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have given your heart to Jesus and, and you're praying for him to fill you with all of his goodness and all of his mercy, and he fills you with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you still need to run as fast as you can and be baptized in the name of Jesus and in water. And he goes on in verse 39, for the promise is for you. Some people say this promise here was only for a certain time, a certain people, but yet as talking about this, as Peter's preaching, he says to them in verse 39, for the promise, the promise of what? The promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The promise of what Jesus said he would pray and the Father would send. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself, not just a certain sect of people, not just a certain generation of people or time span, or not just until the Bible is written in print and put into our hands, but he says to all who are called to himself, all to whom God calls to himself. Wow, that's, that's powerful. John 7, 37 through 39 says, On the last day of the feast, that great day, Jesus stood up and cried out 
If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I don't know about all of you, but I want rivers of living water to flow out of me. Don't you? I want rivers of life to flow out of me. The river of God to flow out of me. The power of God to flow out of me. What is the significance of that? Would I not be as an individual just thrilled to death if the flood of God's presence was just all in me? I'm sure I would feel the refreshing of the presence of the Lord and I would enjoy uh, feasting and enjoying the blessings of the Lord. But he says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. To me, that's significant because what he's talking about is that blessing of God, that, that, that presence of God, that baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's not just for me, but he wants it to flow out of me onto others who also can enjoy and benefit from that. Because listen, that's exactly in this passage of scripture here, what he's talking about. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, verse 38, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now listen, now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him, hold on, wait a minute. They were already believers. Those who believed in him were to receive for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Wow. Jesus was not yet glorified. But yet we know what the scripture is teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Next week, we're gonna to begin to talk about um, the record in the scripture of them receiving the Holy Spirit and how they received the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're gonna look at, and remember, and remember um, the book, books of the gospels were telling them what they were gonna do and the New Testament book of Acts tells us how they did it. How they walked out what Jesus told them they were to do. And so we're going to look next week on how did they receive, how was the baptism of the Holy Spirit received, and how and what took place when that happened. But but Father, I pray in the name of Jesus as we end here tonight, God, open up our understanding. Open up our hearts to receive. Father, I pray that any embedded doctrine and any preconceived ideas would be um, taken away. God, I pray that you would eradicate them and that, God, we would open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word and that we would not study to prove a point, but we would study to find out a truth. God, I pray for those that are out there right now who maybe have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but yet they're not free to operate or exercise the gifts and the things that you have placed in them. God, I pray, set them free in the name of Jesus and let them begin to walk in their gift and their ministry. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus right now that you would just touch their heart. God, that you would break off every chain of understanding, break off every chain of the lack of understanding. God, touch their lives and move in their hearts right now that they can open up their hearts and receive all the gifts and things that you have for them. Father, we just ask these in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you so much for being a part of us tonight with us tonight and and uh, we love you and we appreciate you and we're praying that God would just bless you abundantly right now. Amen. God bless you.